Anyway, so a young man was traveling in the Middle East and seeking after God. Uh, his story is recorded to, uh, actually in the book of, uh, of Acts, uh, in Acts chapter uh, 8. Uh, but uh, his uh, search uh, leading uh, him to Jerusalem from, from North Africa. Uh, he was a, a man of uh, position, held a high government position. He had uh, certainly uh, uh, great wealth, uh, drove an Escalade chariot. Uh, he was all decked out. But um, some of you are going, what's an Escalade? <laughs> I have to stick with the BMW. People can relate to that maybe more. Anyway, he's powerful, wealthy. Uh, he uh, had all the materialism uh, of, the, of this world that it had to offer, but he was still seeking uh, after God. While he's in Jerusalem, he buys a scroll that uh, is, uh, again, 700 years old, written by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and as he is on his way back to North Africa, then he is reading it, and he reads the passage uh, that is our text uh, this morning. Uh, and as he is reading it, uh, he is questioning whether the prophet is speaking about himself or someone else. Uh, at that time, God has a man, another young guy named Philip on the side of the road that's able to overhear him and kind of runs along with him uh, and is able to tell him, uh, I know who the prophet is talking about, jumps up in his chariot and uh, begins to explain the, the scriptures to him. And by the time they're done, uh, that young man from Ethiopia comes to faith in Christ because of what I, Isaiah said that we're going to be studying this morning. Uh, they get out of the chariot, he gets baptized, he takes the gospel back to North Africa, and the Coptic Christians uh, that are being persecuted today in Egypt trace their spiritual heritage uh, back to this uh, young man we know as the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. In uh, Acts 8.34, uh, it says, So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this of himself or some others? Uh, because there are those... Uh, that would question who is the prophet uh, uh, speaking about. And, uh, and our first point is going to deal with uh, uh, that Isaiah is predicting something about the Messiah when he comes that no other prophet said. All the other prophets talked about when the Messiah comes, he'll be the king. He'll rule and reign. He'll sit on the throne of David from Jerusalem and so forth. So it's pretty radical stuff when Isaiah comes along and says, uh, hold on there. It, it's not going to really go down like that. Uh, and the only explanation for uh, understanding both aspects of the Messiah is to realize he came one time, but he's coming a, a second time uh, as well. One of the things that we appreciate about uh, the prophets of the Old Testament is they not only spoke to the spiritual condition of the people to try to call them back to God for their primary function, uh, but they also then predicted things that would happen in the future in order to authenticate their, their own message uh, and therefore the scriptures to us. I, I was reading some, uh, some projections from a, a magazine called The Futurist, uh, which talks about uh, some of the worst predictions of, of all time because uh, people don't always get it right in terms of their predictions. One of them was that uh, inventions have long since reached their limit and I see no hope for further developments. That was a Roman engineer uh, named uh, Fontinius uh, in AD 100. I kind of maybe messed up on that one a little bit. Uh, you might appreciate this one. Uh, Junius Henry Brown in 1893 said, law will be simplified over the next century. Lawyers have, will have diminished and their fees will have become vastly curtailed. <laughs> I'd say he kind of missed that one a little bit as well. I like this one. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter what he does. He'll never amount to anything. That was said to Albert Einstein's father in 1895. I would say that teacher missed that prediction. Uh, John Van Nauman in 1949 said, who was a computer scientist, 1949, it would have appeared that we've reached the limits of what is possible to achieve with computer technology, 1949. Thank you. Here we go. Some of them are pretty, pretty funny. Uh, it, it's easy to make these predictions uh, of the future. But in the Old Testament, of course, if a prophet said something and it didn't come through, oh, that's a capital punishment. He's taken out and actually executed. So when, when someone stood and said, thus says the Lord, the Lord has shown me, he's putting his life on the line. It's not somebody to say, hey, I'm making some predictions for the new year. Uh, it was very serious business. Well, let's see how Isaiah the prophet did here. In, uh, in chapter 53. Uh, very easy to outline again. It's Jesus prior to he goes to the cross. First three verses. Then there'll be a picture of him on the cross. 
uh, and then the purpose of that cross. Uh, he begins by saying, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So uh, prior to the cross, we're saying uh, a Messiah comes. Uh, uh, Isaiah says it's going to be, wow, really unexpected. It's not what you're thinking is going to happen when the Messiah comes. Uh, he mentions the fact of his own message. Uh, who's believed our report? Who's believed the message? It's going to be tough for people to believe. Uh, a Messiah that comes, who uh, is, uh, leaves heaven, comes to earth, lives a perfect sinless life, and then dies on a Roman cross. No, nobody's waiting for that one. Nobody expects that one. Uh, they're, they're wanting Jesus to be that, that conquering king. Uh, and, of course, that's what they, they wanted in the first century to drive out the, uh, the Roman government from their land. Uh, the uh, suffering servant is contrary to uh, the thinking of, of the Jews in that day, as well as the Romans uh, and the Greek thinkers uh, as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's a paradox that God would come himself and become a suffering servant rather than just establishing uh, his kingdom. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said uh, of uh, a paradox, it's truth standing on its head trying to get attention. Uh, and, uh, and we don't want to miss the paradox here. Uh, in terms of both of these truths, Jesus will come one day as the conquering king. He will establish his kingdom. Uh, we can as enter into his kingdom personally now when we bow our knee uh, to him as king, uh, as Lord and Savior. But one day he will establish his kingdom. Uh, but Isaiah says when he shows up the, uh, the first time, it's going to be rather unexpected. <clears throat> this is what Paul says about the cross in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Uh, we, we that have been saved, we recognize the power of the cross and what Christ has done for us. And there's lots of people uh, that would agree with this statement by Isaiah. Who's believed our message? There's a lot of people that don't. Uh, and the cross is simply foolishness to them. It was true of uh, first century Judaism. It was true of the, uh, the Greek thinking Romans uh, uh, as well. <clears throat> and our problem, as we mentioned, is that um, we, we really don't want to consider the cross and think about the cross because it's got personal implications. If Jesus had to die, he had to die for everyone. Uh, and I don't want to think about somebody dying for me in that way and that kind of brutality uh, for me personally. It brings up the, the issue of death that we don't want to talk about, and it brings up the issue of personal sin that we don't want to talk about. It's no wonder the cross is an offense to a lot of people. It's no wonder that <clears throat> there's people all around our country that spend thousands of dollars in attorney's fees every year just to try to get crosses removed uh, from uh, every, every public building, every public place that they're in. Uh, they're going to be taking them off the churches here one of these days if, uh, if we don't turn this thing around in terms of uh, God moving to the hearts of, uh, of people in our country. Chuck Colson a number of years ago wrote that the cross reminds us that our lives are measured not by us or by our peers, but by whom we were created and called to be. And the measuring is done by the one who creates and calls. Instead of glossing over our sin with an understanding nod, the cross renders the verdict on the gravity of our sin. <clears throat> it's a big deal. Uh, it's, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy thing, this idea of our sin. Uh, and Isaiah says when the Messiah comes, he's not going to be what people expected. He's not going to set up his kingdom. He's actually going to suffer and die. <clears throat> and then his uh, home and social status is uh, not what will be expected either. Verse 2, for uh, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground. Speaks of the vulnerability of Jesus. Uh, the dry ground was certainly Israel. Uh, again, uh, G the Messiah was supposed to become in the lineage of David. He would be the Davidic king. Well, there was no king in Israel. There was no Davidic king. There was a king appointed by Rome. But he didn't have any, any, any lineage to David. Uh, it was very dry ground in Israel at that time. <clears throat> it was a very corrupt time within Judaism. Even in, uh, according to uh, Jewish history. Uh, again, born in a manger, not in a palace. 
His followers were common peoples, not the movers and shakers of the world. He grows up in Nazareth, very dry ground. Not the kind of place that you would expect the Messiah to come from. His disciples, a bunch of smelly fishermen, not the elite educated of society of that day. Uh, very much not the home or social status that the people would have been expecting. And then third, his appearance was not what they expected. It says he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Hey, we live in a culture where it's all about looks. It's all about uh, beauty. And uh, we could go through the statistics of how much money is spent every year uh, just trying to make us all look better. But, uh, uh, you know, when Jesus came, uh, he looked like everybody else. He looked like the average person. Isaiah says, you know, there's nothing in his appearance when he shows up that you're going to desire him. There's nothing to attract uh, you to him because of his physical appearance. Now, now Hollywood obviously kind of misses this, and they always, they always have some pretty handsome guys to be, uh, to be Jesus. Uh, I think the, the guy that played the part here in the Jesus of Nazareth film probably needed to uh, hit the gym a little more there. You know, he's, uh, there was uh, an era where uh, in the media and art, they kind of almost like feminized uh, Jesus. But again, he was a carpenter. Uh, and if you've been to Israel, you know that a lot of what they built with was rocks. You know, so <laughs> he very easily could have been a stonemason as well as a, quote, carpenter fix-it uh, man. Uh, this is a, these guys walked everywhere, uh, but, uh, and he was just the average guy. Uh, when, when Judas has to point him out uh, for his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas can pinpoint the exact place he's going to be, but there's a, a bunch of other guys there as well, his other uh, disciples, uh, and Judas has to say, I'll identify him with a kiss so you know who to arrest. You can't say, he's the tall guy. He's the guy with the hazel eyes. He's the only guy with blonde hair in the whole country. Now, he, he, it's a halo. You'll see it, you know. Uh, th there's nothing. There's nothing about him, uh, about his appearance to attract us to him. And we, uh, we, uh, you know, we kind of get uh, a misunderstanding about that in terms of, uh, of his appearance. He looked like everybody else, which meant he had black hair, mid-brown skin, and brown eyes like uh, two-thirds of the people on the planet today. He just... He just fed in. He was just uh, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, not what they uh, expected. Verse 14, uh, just as many were astonished at you. So his visage was marred uh, more than any man. That's of chapter 52. Isaiah's already mentioned that. Uh, and his form more than the sons of men. The NIV kind of captured the thought this way. It says, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness, speaking about his, his, uh, uh, what he looked like on the cross. Now, keep in mind, uh, by the time Jesus even gets to the cross, uh, to be nailed on the cross, he's been beaten to a pulp, and it's no wonder that Pilate, when he brings him out after the scourging of the cat of nine tails, says, Behold the man. He's identifying. This is a person here. He's a human being, because he didn't look like it uh, anymore. Uh, in his regular physical appearance, much less what he looked like on the cross. There would be nothing in that to attract us to him. It's not the Messiah they would expect. Uh, and of course, he was, uh, they weren't expecting to reject the Messiah. Uh, they were looking forward to welcoming the Messiah. And of course, uh, and not only through that 700-year period from the time that Isaiah wrote this to the first century under the Roman rule, they were looking for someone to come uh, and be their liberator and be their king. Uh, and nobody was predicting except Isaiah that, oh, by the way, when he comes, he's going to be rejected. We will reject him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men. The term means to regard as negligible or worthless. Psychologists use the term discount to describe the treatment uh, that Jesus received. Isaiah says, 700 years from now, there's, a, there's going to be a Messiah that comes. And when he comes, he's not going to be what you expect at all. Uh, his ministry and his mission is not going to be what you expect uh, as well. Uh, prior to the cross, not the Messiah they expected. And prior to the cross, his humanity would be clearly visible. Uh, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And certainly we see his sorrows on many occasions. There is nowhere in the Bible where it ever records Jesus laughing. Now, I, I kind of personally think, you, you know, if you hang around Peter, James, and John a lot, you got to laugh a little, you know, uh, because of some of the stuff they said, uh, and, uh, and they did. These are grown men that fight over who gets to sit where at the table every night when they sit down to dinner. 
Uh, and I would think you'd have to have a sense of humor to survive that. Uh, but really, in Scripture, there's no reference to his laughing and so forth. Uh, certainly, uh, he was the man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with, uh, with grief. In Matthew uh, 23, 37, Jesus says, overlooking the city as he's weeping it, understanding that they have rejected him, uh, and they will come under a judgment uh, as a result of that. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. You were not willing. Jesus said, this is what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to gather you together. I wanted to draw you into myself, but I respected your free will choice. Uh, this is what you've chosen. I'll respect that free will choice. And God still does that today. He respects every person's free will choice. Everybody has to make a decision and make a choice whether to receive or to reject uh, Jesus Christ. But he weeps over it uh, when it when it happens. When he stands before the tomb of, of Lazarus, his good friend, uh, whose uh, home he stayed in on many occasions, uh, and he's delayed his coming knowing that Lazarus would die. Of course, he's going to raise him from the dead, but he wept at the tomb of, of Lazarus. I don't know if it was because of the idea of death and what it does to us. Uh, again, the uh, part of the penalty of, of sin entering this world, <clears throat> whether it was the lack of faith uh, from, uh, from Martha or what it was, but he wept at the death of Lazarus. In John 1.11, it says, It came to his own, and his own did not receive him. He was a man of sorrows. He was accused of being a drunkard. He was accused of being demon-possessed uh, by the very people that he came uh, to save. Now, we know in the end, there was great joy. Uh, we'll talk about a, a reference to that in a moment. But uh, uh, he was certainly a man uh, acquainted with sorrow, not what they expected. Prior to the cross, uh, it's certainly an interesting picture of him. The picture of Jesus on the cross continues in verse 4 to 9, where it says, Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who can declare uh, his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So uh, four aspects of this picture of Jesus being on the cross. And the first one uh, is the obvious he would die for others. He's not dying for himself. He's not dying because he committed a crime. He's not dying for anything that he's done. He's dying for others. Verse 4, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. It's not his, it's ours. He's dying in, uh, in our place. Isaiah saying, saying 700 years from now, the Messiah is going to come and he's actually going to die. He's not going to die for himself. He's going to die for us. Uh, the word grief sometimes is translated infirmities. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, that's, we, we see that in regards to, uh, to sickness, and certainly sin is a type of sickness. Sometimes we say, this is a sick world that we live in. If you watch, uh, watch the news at night and so forth, because there's evil, there's atrocities, and it seems like they're just growing, or maybe we're just more aware of them uh, and, uh, in the days that, uh, that we live in. Terrible things that are going on in Syria and other places uh, uh, around the world where 150,000 people have been killed in a, in a civil war, and it doesn't seem like there's anybody... Any good guys we can even cheer for or whatever. Right? They're just uh, horrific things that are, uh, that are going, going on. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the story of the, uh, the Jews coming out of, uh, uh, of synagogue uh, at Passover in uh, eastern Ukraine and be handed official notices from the government of that city saying, you must register. Uh, and if you do not register, you and your property will be confiscated. You'll be deported. This is an area where they've got family members that died in the Holocaust. Uh, there's horrific things that are going on uh, around the world today. It's a sick world. It's because of sin, uh, and it affects everybody. It affects each and every one of us. 
Uh, Jesus kind of brought it this way. He says you could go through the law and see if anyone's disobeyed. But he says, you know what? If you've even thought these thoughts, uh, you've, you've still sinned. It's a, a sin nature, we say. Some people are, are offended. Oh, don't, don't call me a, a sinner. It, it means you're not perfect. You know, if you're not sure about that, just ask your husband or wife. They'll, 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 they'll fill you in later. If we took a picture of all of us uh, today, uh, and, then, and then we put that picture uh, outside next week so you can see the, the group shot of Calvary Chapel Windward on Resurrection Day, uh, all of us would do the same thing. We'd look at that picture and we'd, there I am. Yeah, I look okay. My eyes are open. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a pretty good spot. How's everybody else? No, nobody, nobody looks for everybody else. Don't care about me. I just want to make sure everybody else looks good in this picture. How I look personally, oh, I never even give it a thought. No, we're not like that. We're not like that. We uh, pass the plate of strawberries around. It's like, oh, that's the biggest one right there. <laughs> Nobody's going, give me the smallest one because the other's first. Uh, you know, uh, God wants to work those things in our heart to be others oriented, uh, to learn is more blessed to give than to receive. But that's not our natural condition. Uh, it's actually in our, our DNA. Sometimes it's, uh, it's likened to the idea of, uh, of leprosy. <clears throat> leprosy can be compared to to sin because uh, it's so insidious and it it, uh, it grows very small, but it, but it has these incredible results. We used to uh, <clears throat> back when I was coaching high school volleyball, and we take the kids to Molokai once a year to uh, to play a, a little couple of matches uh, with uh, one of the schools over there, and they would host us, and we'd stay there over uh, Friday night and stuff. So uh, I would uh, drive the kids up uh, while we had time in the afternoon before things got going. There's uh, a lookout where you could look out over the north shore of, uh, of Molokai, very beautiful. <clears throat> and down below you is the peninsula of Kalapapa. And I tell them the story of Father Damien and his sacrifice to uh, care for the leper patients there, which was uh, horrific uh, in, uh, in his day. Uh, and eventually, uh, as you know, uh, he succumbed to uh, leprosy uh, himself uh, and sacrificially giving his lives uh, for others. And I would talk about how, how it affects the nervous system. Uh, and people are unaware then be, of, the, of what they're doing to themselves. You know, they could burn their hand in a fire. They could uh, do all kind of detrimental things to themselves because they're, they're unaware of how they're being affected by it. And that's a picture of sin. It's in every one of us. And, uh, and if it's not dealt with, if the cure doesn't come to us, which is the cross of Jesus Christ, it destroys us. And we're just unaware uh, of, uh, of, of what's happening to us. And how we're, our lives are being destroyed. But Isaiah says, when the Messiah comes, uh, he will die for others. And it's because of sin. Uh, secondly, the picture would include a Messiah who would be rejected by those he died for. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and, a, and afflicted. And certainly this is a, a picture of Jesus Christ on the, uh, on the cross. Uh, there for six hours, those first three men doing his worst to him. God veiling as it would with an eclipse or a supernatural blackout over the city of Jerusalem uh, is uh, uh, what takes place we, we don't fully uh, comprehend or claim to understand. Uh, but we understand what the Bible says in terms of that uh, our sin is laid on him uh, just in the same way. Uh, then an individual prior to that would go into the temple and lay their hands on a lamb. And that lamb's uh, throat would be slit and the blood would be poured out. And the lamb becomes the identifying point of his sin. And that blood, it can't take it away. It simply atones for it. That person is saying, one day God will take my sin away. I'm going to be obedient to him. Uh, this is a horrific thing. It reminds me of how horrible my sin is. You say, isn't that gross? Absolutely. And it was a picture of our sin. And when we look at Jesus Christ on the cross, again, it's a picture of what our, our sin does. As, uh, as he cries from the cro cross, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As, uh, as the fellowship that the Father and the Son have known from all eternity is <clears throat> separated for a portion of time as God lays on him uh, the sins of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me, one writer said, who delivered up Jesus to die, not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. On a human level, Judas gave him to the priest, who gave him to the Pilate, uh, who gave him to the soldiers who crucified him. On a divine level, the Father gave him up, and the Son gave himself to die for us. Pictures of Jesus on the cross, 
by Isaiah 700 years before they took place. The third picture would include a Messiah who would die to bring healing to others. And by his stripes, we are healed. Many of our songs even mention this particular phrase. What kind of healing are we talking about? Are we talking about physical healing or spiritual healing? Well, God certainly does heal. Uh, we pray for heal, healing. We see him uh, uh, do miraculous things and so forth. He doesn't always. We don't always understand the whys and so forth. Uh, but I think Peter helps us in this point to know what is he really talking about. Uh, Peter, in 1 Peter 2.24 writing about this and quoting this passage of Jesus said, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Uh, I always say that the Bible is a very good commentary on the Bible. And according to Peter, uh, those stripes are talking about our healing that we needed in terms of our sinful condition. Uh, again, God gives us, when we come to faith in Christ, a new nature. We no longer have to live for that old nature. He gives us his uh, Holy Spirit uh, and, uh, and makes us a new creature in Christ. All things pass away. All things become new. The Lord begins a transformation uh, in our lives. Verse 5, it says, uh, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Transgression means rebellion. Again, his hands uh, and his feet and his side pierced for us because we were in rebellion uh, against God. Why did he need to die? Well, verse 6 says, uh, All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, we have turned everyone to his own way. And again, that's a picture. That's what sheep do without a shepherd. They just kind of go astray. They just kind of wander off. Uh, they do a, a lot of damage to themselves without a shepherd to lead uh, and to guide them. And it's a picture of what's happened to all of us individually and certainly to this world and to mankind uh, in general. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin or a sin offering for us that we might become the righteousness of God uh, in him. Didn't die for himself. He was rejected by those he would die for. His death would be for healing. Uh, and, uh, and the picture forth includes a Messiah who would fulfill specific prophecies in the way that he, he died. Uh, verse 7, he was oppressed uh, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Again, Isaiah is saying that one day, turns out to be 700 years later, when the Messiah comes, there will be certain things about his death that you, can, you could know to know that uh, we're talking about the right person. And one would be that uh, in his death, going through all of this, he would be silent. He would be as silent in terms of never defending himself. Pilate, on many occasions, tried to get Jesus to defend himself. Pilate, on seven times declared Jesus to be innocent and tried to wash his hands of the whole situation. He stood before Pilate, uh, before Annas, before Caiaphas, and before Herod. Herod, he said no words at all. He was completely silent. The only thing he would acknowledge before the other three is that he was the king, uh, that he was God, uh, and that uh, he was the, the savior of, of the world. Uh, he wouldn't deny his purpose in coming, his role in coming, or his identity as, uh, as the Son of God. Uh, yeah, but other than that, he was silent in terms of not defending himself. He would fulfill prophecy uh, uh, in his death uh, just in the way he, was, he died. Verse 8, for he was cut off from the land of the living. To be cut off means to die. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to be rejected and he will actually die. But even in his burial, verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich uh, in his death. What should have happened to the, the uh, body of Jesus because he was uh, convicted under Roman law? He, with the other two criminals that died on both sides of them, would have normally had their bodies taken down. And he was assigned a grave with the wicked. It was in the Valley of Hinnon. He's thrown into a garbage dump and his body would have been burned. That was his assigned grave uh, as, uh, as a criminal under the Roman law. But we know, of course, that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, as well as probably uh, Nicodemus, both members of the Sanhedrin, keep in mind that Nicodemus is the teacher of Israel. He's the head rabbi of Israel. 
uh, and they, they go to Pilate uh, and they're able to get the body uh, and they take him to a, uh, again, a tomb uh, that belongs to Nicodemus, uh, or excuse me, to uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, it's there, uh, it's, uh, it's nearby, and they're able to get Jesus' body in there, uh, get him somewhat prepared for, uh, for burial, get a stone rolled across it before the sun went down and the, began a new Shabbat or a new Sabbath. And of course then uh, we're very happy that the critics and the enemies uh, of Christ uh, would require a Roman guard and a Roman seal on that tomb. It would be a lot more difficult to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ had his body been thrown in an open dump and burnt. Anybody could have said, anybody could have got that body. But the fact that he was in a tomb uh, and he was uh, uh, guarded by, uh, by Roman soldiers who would be, have to guard that, uh, that Roman seal to their death uh, it becomes much more credible in terms of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is a tomb to go to. There was a tomb that they went to, uh, and Jesus' body uh, was not there. Pretty, pretty radical prediction. He's going to be assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich at the same time. How is that going to happen? That's exactly what happened. His death prior to, again, Jesus prior to the cross, the picture of him on the cross, and then the purpose of, uh, in the last three verses of him going to the cross, verse 10 to 12. There the prophet says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, uh, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion uh, with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Uh, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So uh, again, we note that the purpose was according to plan. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Uh, he has put him to grief. Again, the Lord is all capital. It's Yahweh. It's God Almighty. It was God's almighty plan to actually send the Messiah uh, who would uh, actually bruise him or crush him uh, and actually put him to, uh, to death. Again, Jesus was, uh, was not murdered. Uh, he gave his life uh, willingly and even said so. Uh, again, this is one of those great paradoxes of how a, a God of love could send his own son uh, to, uh, to die and it, and it having pleased him. Well, we have really two aspects about that because in a sense, uh, though it was a horrific thing, it pleased the Son as well. Uh, that's what it says in Romans 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The writer is uh, writing to believers, saying, <clears throat> don't become discouraged in your old soul. Consider what Jesus went through. Who uh, despised the shame? Did Jesus want to go to the cross? No, he prayed in the Garden of the Gethsemane three times. If there's another way, then let this cup pass from me. If there's another way for what? For salvation. Is there another way for man to be, be saved? Can he just be good enough? Uh, won't there be another religious figure that comes later that tells a better way? No, there's no other way. Uh, it's, it's not happening. Uh, and Jesus determines to go to the cross uh, and, uh, and die for our sins. But it was for the joy set before him. That joy is you and I. Uh, Jesus knew the outcome uh, of his death on the cross. Uh, and therefore, though he despised the shame, there was, there was still a joy in it. Now, John, when he's writing... Uh, writing his gospel, uh, he makes the comparison of this uh, aspect of Jesus' death on the cross to, to childbirth. Uh, the idea that a woman could be in labor and in great pain, but once the child is born, all the pain is forgotten because of the joy of having the child there, uh, there with them. No amens from the gals, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, that's what I'm told, anyway. That's just what I'm told. And uh, I, I, I've watched it a couple of times. And I can verify there's a lot of pain going on. And there's a lot of joy uh, as well later. Uh, that's, that's the analogy anyway John tries to help us understand. Uh, Jesus is willing to go through this because of the outcome, what it will produce in terms of our salvation. 
So he's willing. He's willing to go through it. And the Father is willing to send him uh, to do it. Some of you might have thought it was uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, God the Son was gone for a bit, and he came back. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit said, We have an idea for the salvation of mankind. And we took a little vote. You're the one that's going. Now, it didn't happen like that. Uh, Jesus willingly came. Uh, God the Father willingly sent him. Uh, and uh, sometimes we talk of this idea of, of that uh, when we come to faith in Christ, he justifies us. He, he, uh, he justifies us in terms of uh, the forgiveness of our, uh, of our sins, making us just as if we hadn't sinned. Uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, the Father justifies himself by sending Jesus to die on the cross uh, for our sins. God said, the, sin that soul, the, the soul that sins will die. Uh, and, uh, and he doesn't kind of, when man falls into sin, uh, to sin, just go, well, ollie, ollie, oxen free. I was just kind of kidding there. No, God has integrity. We talk about his holiness uh, uh, and his righteousness. Uh, we, could, uh, we could illustrate it this way just with an earthly uh, father. I remember one of the guys uh, uh, talking about the fact that I uh, said something to him about uh, what he can do this afternoon after uh, church. And he said, well, we we're planning on going to the beach, except... I kind of made the mistake of saying to the kids uh, in the car right before we went on and uh, dropped them off to Sunday school, all right, everybody behave, and then we're going to be going to go to the beach afterwards. We're going to get hamburgers. We're going to do this. We're going to have a great time. But you've got to behave in Sunday school, blah, blah, blah. And if you don't behave, then we're not going. He lived to regret those words because they didn't behave apparently that day. Uh, and so like a good father who's going to maintain his integrity, they're not going to the beach. He's going to maintain his word. He's not going to allow their bad behavior to turn him into a liar, uh, which would be very bad for those kids. They need to grow up seeing a dad that's going to uh, live up to his word and keep his word. So he said, yep, so we're not going to the beach today. God the Father uh, justifies himself by sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. How can he live up to his word, maintain his, his holiness and his integrity, and somehow still forgive us of our sins? He can't just say, it, I'll act like it didn't happen. There has to be a justification, and sending Jesus to die on the cross would, uh, would deal with that, that area of justification for the Father himself. Um, I love this quote from, uh, from Kent Hughes in regards to uh, John 3.16 and uh, and the way he adds just a short little phrase that just uh, gives it such wonderful meaning. He says, For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act. His only begotten Son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest opportunity, believeth the greatest simplicity, in him the greatest attraction, should not perish the greatest promise, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. Uh, and uh, certainly John 3, 16, everybody should uh, memorize that verse because it encapsulates uh, uh, the gospel. Jesus dying for our sins, uh, the whosoever's, that's anybody that would believe and put their faith in him, uh, would have everlasting life. Certainly the greatest opportunity. Secondly, the purpose of Jesus going to the cross uh, was for our salvation. Verse 11, it not only justified God the Father so he could forgive us of our sins, but verse 11 says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Seeing the labor of his soul. He died for us, but he rose again on the third day. And because of his resurrection, uh, he conquers death. He conquers sin, uh, death, and hell. Uh, again, uh, sin has a penalty that's removed. Sin also has power over us that's removed as well. The penalty of sin is removed when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. The power of sin to control and dominate uh, over our lives, to cause us to live in habitual patterns that are destructive, uh, those are destroyed as well when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's not all done away with at once, but God the Spirit begins to work in our lives to transform and change us and make us into somebody, you know what, we always wanted to be anybody. Uh, we just need to surrender to him and allow him to do that beautiful work uh, in our lives. Uh, notice that uh, it says in verse 11, by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many. 
Again, that's that word justify. Uh, again, uh, Paul uses it in Romans 4.25, uh, speaking of Jesus, who was delivered up for our offenses and was raised because of our justification. It's a judicial term. It's when the judge takes the gavel and goes, not guilty. Uh, and that's what God says to each of us if we place our faith uh, in him uh, and trust in him. Uh, it means that, uh, uh, again, it's just as if we haven't sin, sin in the Father's sight. It, there's still repercussions. Uh, it's been a long time, uh, but I remember when the, the whole AIDS thing was, was first happening, uh, praying with a young guy that received, uh, received Christ, uh, and in God's sight, it was though he had never sinned, but he still died of AIDS. Uh, there's still consequences to bad decisions uh, and sinful things in our life when we come to faith in Christ. There's consequences. Uh, but God can walk us through those things and be with us, uh, whatever it is. But the comforting thing is to know that in God's sight, the way he looks at us and the way he relates to us, it's just as if we haven't ever sinned. That's why Paul is able to say in Romans 8, 1, there therefore is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, religion brings a lot of condemnation to people. Religion will bring people into some kind of fear that they've got to do something uh, in order to, they might attain some kind of favor with God. Christianity is the opposite. Uh, our, our whole lives are spent in response to God's love. God's loved me. He's justified me. He's forgiven me. Uh, he never even looks at my sin or thinks about it uh, another way. Uh, it's as far as the east is from the west. He's waiting to welcome me into heaven. He's doing all this for me. He's my good shepherd. He's the rock that stands with me. Wow, what can I do for you? That, that's the idea. I just want to, to love God back. Uh, it's a relationship that we have. It's not religion at all. Uh, and certainly, uh, religion never brings uh, this judicial term of justification. Jesus prays that we'll understand the plan and purpose of the cross there. Notice he uh, bore the sin of many uh, and made intercession for the transgression. That says that while Jesus is paying the price, the Messiah, remember Isaiah? 700 years from now, this Messiah is going to come. And in the midst of him bearing the punishment for our sin, he's going to be praying. He's going to be interceding. Of course, Jesus did that. And we saw that in the video clip when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's important to understand that uh, uh, under the uh, Old Testament economy or the law, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, if you intentionally sinned, there was no forgiveness. Those offerings were, and the sin offerings were, when you sinned unintentionally. You're unaware. Wow, I didn't even know I sinned that way. I better go down and make the offering. There, there, was, there was nothing for you if you just, you just flat out uh, sin, sinned against God. So Jesus is interceding and praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. All of this can be, all of this can be forgiven. And certainly he's speaking to all of us, but he was speaking to uh, that particular generation uh, as well. Uh, amazing. How did, how did Isaiah do 700 years in advance? Uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good. Everything just uh, certainly uh, follows the, the gospel presentations uh, that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and John. Uh, the picture of Jesus before he comes, uh, not what they had expected, not what a lot of people expect today. Uh, the suffering servant of Isaiah 50, uh, 53. Uh, I want to show you one other picture just uh, in conclusion here. And it's of a, uh, a coin uh, called the Liberty Head uh, Nickel minute uh, in 1913. A guy named George Owen Walton uh, purchased this coin for $3,750 uh, in 1945. Uh, he was an appraiser and did, uh, uh, did auctions and stuff like that. And along the way, started collecting coins. And when he saw this, he said, man, i got to have that coin. Uh, his family thought he was crazy spending that kind of money for a nickel. Uh, he says, no, this, this coin is going to be worth a fortune someday. Uh, he never realized uh, that, though. He never got to see it. 1962, on the way to a coin show, he, he dies in a car accident. Uh, his family then finds a, a box uh, with the coin in it. They take it down to get it appraised, uh, and it was labeled no value, no value at all, that it was a fake. Well, he kind of went to this person in the family and that person in the family, and his nephew kept it because, well, it was important to my uncle and it was his favorite coin, so I'm, I'm going to keep it. Uh, and then in 2003, he saw an article where there's going to be a display of the other four known Liberty, Liberty Nichols, all, all from 1913. And in the ad, it said there's a fifth nickel out there somewhere, 
And, it, and if somebody brings it in, we'll give them a million dollars for it. So he says, well, I got nothing to lose. So he takes this nickel down. Uh, and, uh, and now these experts appraise it and say, that's the fifth nickel. And he says, uh, so he, but he didn't get a million dollars for it. He put it up for auction. He got $3.1 million for it. The whole point of saying is that, you know, when Jesus came, there were a lot of experts that said he's not the Messiah. But he fit the picture beautifully. He fulfilled every passage of Scripture. And, of course, we know that in time, even in that generation, there were tens of thousands that received him as, uh, as their Messiah. But what an accurate picture uh, and give us uh, the understanding that we need to be reminded of that Jesus died for us. It's a simple message. Uh, we just place our faith in him. Paul says that this way in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him. For whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a religion to join. It's not a church to join. It's not a ritual you do. Uh, it's simply you just call on the name of the Lord. Uh, you place your faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. He died for you. You accept his free gift uh, of eternal life. You recognize him that uh, is Lord and, uh, and Savior. Uh, it's just that's that simple. Uh, and that's what brings you into the family of God. That's what gives you salvation. That's what gives you eternal life uh, in heaven uh, with him. And that's why we're all here celebrating today. Because Jesus rose again from the dead to authenticate everything that, uh, that he said. Uh, and in doing so, uh, prove that we would have everlasting life as well. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, he who believes in me will live even though uh, he dies. Amen. There's a lot of uh, uh, maybe people that, uh, that sometimes you know, wait too long to, uh, to make that discovery. Uh, I would just encourage you to not wait. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That means to, today is a good day uh, to, to have that recognition. Rescued my soul, given me strength, answered my every call, given me life, opened my eyes, God. Your blood.